And good evening, everybody, and welcome to this uh, live online forum, What's Really Going On with the War in Ukraine, uh, presented by the Progressive Magazine, based here in Madison, Wisconsin, and with uh, a whole series of uh, sponsoring organizations, uh, including Code Pink, Madison Veterans for Peace, the Madison Working Group on Peace in Ukraine, Physicians for Social Responsibility, Wisconsin Safe, Sk Safe Skies Clean Water, the Madison Area Democratic Socialists of America, and the Madison branch of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. So thank you all for joining us tonight and uh, welcome to our conversation about the war in Ukraine. Uh, we have two very special guests with us. I want to begin uh, by introducing them. And we have uh, Phyllis Bennis, who is a program director at the Institute for Policy Studies with a focus on U.S. foreign policy and longtime activist on uh, these issues. And also Zoltan Grossman, uh, who's a longtime observer and writer on Eastern Europe and a member of the faculty in geography and indigenous studies at the Evergreen State College in Olympia, Washington. Uh, so welcome uh, to both of you this evening. Uh, the way the program is going to work is each of our panelists is going to uh, make a presentation and then we're going to uh, have some conversation between us and also open it up for questions from the audience. And you that are watching right now will be able to ask your questions by chatting them either in YouTube or in uh, Facebook. And then uh, I'll take those questions and uh, verbally ask them to our uh, our panelists. So that's the uh, that's the format, and we'll go for uh, you know about an hour or so. And uh, we are uh, very happy to uh, have you all with us. Well, I'd like to start by um, uh, sharing the screen here with Zoltan, who is going to uh, begin by talking a little bit about uh, the uh, the history and geography of Ukraine. Okay, can you see that? Norm, can you see it um, fine? No, we cannot see your screen yet. Oh, that's weird, okay. Oh, allow. And how about now? Nope, not yet. Oh. It worked when we tested it earlier. Exactly, um, you're dead. <laughs> in the meantime, uh, I'll uh, I'll let people know about this event and how it came to be. The um, group that was formed here immediately following the um, uh, Russian attack on Ukraine is the group called um, the Madison Working Group on Peace in Ukraine, and the idea was to have an event that would be informational that would talk about uh, what's going on in Ukraine and what the peace and justice movement uh, can do to respond to this. And so that's uh, why we invited our panelists this evening and are sharing this information with you. Uh, and so we hope that when we get to the question and answer part of the program that you'll be, uh, you'll be able to um, uh, ask questions and kind of direct the conversation uh, on those issues. Uh, how's how's that looking at your end, Sultan? It says you are sharing your entire screen, but obviously it's not. So let me try it again. Stop. You push the sh the screen share at the bottom there. Yes, and it says entire screen. Allow. And how is that? Nope. Nope. Wow. This is exactly what we did before this afternoon. Okay. Do you want to uh, email your PowerPoint to me really quickly? I think that might take a while. 
share screen. Unable to share screen. Hmm. Um, why don't we start out with Phyllis? <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to uh, bring Phyllis on and uh, maybe uh, Zoltan, what you could do is is reboot your laptop and see if yeah, that's that, exactly uh, what I'm going to do. Um, uh, so, <laughs> sorry about the uh, technical glitch there, but I'd like to welcome uh, Phyllis Bennis, again, um, a program director at the Institute for Policy Studies with a focus on U.S. foreign policy. And Phyllis, you have done uh, quite a bit of um, uh, speaking and um, uh, discussing Ukraine, and we're very, very eager to, uh, to hear your, your comments this evening. Well, thanks very much, Norman, and thank you for trying, Zoltan. I was really looking forward to seeing your maps. I can't wait. So I'm still hoping that we'll figure out the, the technology, which somehow is always the problem in these things. But a big thanks to the progressive, to, to all of you for coming out tonight to talk about this. I think that what one of the things we're seeing right now is that it's much easier for progressives and the left and, and the broad, the broad uh, peace movement in this country uh, it's much easier for us to understand wars and to oppose wars when they're clearly led by the United States, by our government. We don't always do it right. We don't always succeed, but we know what that looks like. We know how, how to react to it. This is different, and it's a struggle. It's a struggle. I think that we do have some good examples out there. I, I was uh, with the Poor People's Campaign last weekend in here in Washington with thousands of people with Reverend Liz Theo Harris and Reverend William Barber, uh, and their response around issues of militarism and, and the military budget, the war economy, uh, has been very, very consistent. And I think it's a good model for us in all these situations where they re respond with the need to cut the military budget for both two reasons, not just one reason, not only because we need the money from the military budget to be brought home for things like healthcare and jobs and new green technologies and all of that, but also so we stop killing people around the world. And that dual nature of why we have to cut the military budget is, I think, always a really good starting point for how we look at any war, whether it's caused by our country or not. There are clearly differences in this war, in the war in Ukraine, in terms of how, how it's viewed by, by our movement, but also by elite forces, by the government, by the media. Um, and in the question of Ukraine, I, in my view, there is no question that this was a provoked war. The U.S. has been provoking uh, Russia for many years through, its, through, through NATO and on its own in terms of expanding NATO, in terms of bringing weapons right up to the Russian border uh, in all of those ways. And it's also true that Russia's response, its militarized response of invasion and occupation of Ukraine was absolutely not inevitable. And in my view, absolutely illegal in terms of international law of a whole host of, of ways. So saying that it was provoked doesn't mean that it was legitimate. I think both those things are true. My colleague, Richard Falk, who some of you may know, I think has had a very useful way of talking about the war, which is to say, that what we're looking at in Ukraine is really two separate wars. There's a ground war in which Russia was the aggressor and remains the aggressor, and it's a brutal, horrific war. And there is a geopolitical war in which the US has been the aggressor for a long time through NATO and its allies in, in Europe. And the irony, of course, is that in both cases, the wars are being fought to the last Ukrainian. I do think that while we acknowledge that the US is an aggressor in the geopolitical framework, Russia remains the aggressor on the ground war that is slaughtering so many people right now. It's also, for me, not a problem. I think that it's important that we acknowledge that Russia is not the Soviet Union, right? It's a neoliberal, repressive, in my view, reactionary, militaristic state uh, to which I feel like we owe no loyalty and no need to defend its, its actions. But I do think it's important that we keep in mind both of those kinds of wars that are, being, uh, that are being fought. Now, we don't have too much time tonight, so I'm gonna skip over the variety of provocations that have been waged. I think most of you are probably, if you've been reading The Progressive, if you've been reading other things in the, uh, in the, in the alternative progressive media, uh, 
you know all these examples. Um, so I'm not going to go through all of those, but I'm just going to urge us to keep in place this notion of there being uh, two wars. And in that context, we both need to be fighting against this war. It, it's a horrific war with, with enormous levels of civilian casualties. We also need to be challenging the kind of anti-Russia, Russia phobia, if you will, uh, that has taken advantage of the fact that Russia was such a longstanding villain in the United States, in the popular mind, uh, and it's now returned to that. So you have not only what I believe to be appropriate opposition to what Russia is doing uh, in Ukraine across the board with no, uh, no defense, but we also are seeing attacks on Russian musicians and Russian athletes and Russian restaurants. It's, and, and that part becomes very, very dangerous in the context of building a kind of hardcore uh, U.S. exceptionalism, a hardcore anti-Russian um, mobilization that leads to greater mobilization, uh, greater militarization all around the world. So I think in some ways looking at this war, it's a bit like looking at Syria in the early years of the horrific war in Syria, where in my view, there were no good guys on the, uh, on the armed, among the armed actors, the numerous armed actors that were all in Syria fighting to the last Syrian. But we also saw the US and Russia both playing an absolutely horrific role in terms of the creation of civilian casualties. So just at the same time that Russian bombers were destroying the ancient city of Aleppo, we saw the US destroying the city of Raqqa uh, with, with equal levels of destruction of people's homes, of, of lives. And that's very much what we're seeing now, I'm afraid, in, in, uh, in, in the Ukraine. So I think we do have to recognize that US military power remains dominant around the world. The US spends more than the next 10 countries combined, including Russia, including China, including all the other big spenders. Uh, it takes the next 10 to equal anything close to what the US spends in a war, uh, in a year, sorry, uh, in a year on war and weapons and NATO. But that doesn't mean that the US is the only aggressor internationally. And in this, in this case, again, we're in a situation where the, is the, the Russian attack, the Russian occupation was absolutely not inevitable or uh, legitimate as a response to that, prov to that provocation. There was a good way that, that Noam Chomsky put it. He said, these serious provocations provide no justification for what Russia did. And I think that's important. So we still have to deal long-term with the US as the, the major military threat in the world and recognize that there are other military threats, in this case, Russia, that are creating these enormous problems. So what are the dangers that we're seeing in this war? What's different for this war than, for example, the so-called forever wars, the global war on terror that has lasted now for more than 20 years? There's a ton of new dangers that were not the case for the US wars in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Somalia, in, in Libya, in other places. The biggest one, of course, being the danger that there could be an escalation to an, a nuclear exchange between the world's two largest nuclear powers, the United States and Russia. That's the single most important threat. And when there is this kind of so close to direct military attack from uh, between those two sides, that's a very, very dangerous possibility. It's a small possibility, but anything more than zero when you're talking about a nuclear exchange is horrifically dangerous and needs to be taken into account at the center of how we deal with ending this war. There's also other dangers that were not the case in the earlier US wars. The, the threat of a massive global food shortage and starvation across much of both Northern and Central Africa, parts of the Middle East, parts of Asia, uh, a horrific reality that is getting worse on a daily basis. The production of more fossil fuels, the end of the search for alternatives and the return to more oil production with all that that means in terms of environmental degradation, the, the uh, protection now of Saudi Arabia, which is suddenly no longer the pariah state that Biden said it was. But now there are buddies because we're going to ask them to produce some more uh, cheaper oil. The war in Yemen will continue as a result. So all of the consequences of this war are far more global than were the consequences of the earlier US wars.
There's also perhaps the most immediate danger of this war is the rise in militarism. That's certainly visible here in the United States with the escalation of military spending. You know, the, the military budget for next year is set to be somewhere around $847 billion. It's almost a trillion dollars. It's one of those numbers that's pretty much incomprehensible. It's, it's, so, it's so enormous. We also see, you know, the continuation, 52 cents of every federal dollar is still being spent on the military. And that doesn't count. For example, the 40 billion that was just approved for Ukraine, half of which is directly going to the military, when that's being put out as a separate supplemental bill, it doesn't even count in that enormous military budget. But we're also seeing the expansion of militarism across Europe. We're seeing NATO being expanded, not only in terms of new members potentially bringing in Sweden and Finland, who had for, for scores of years, for over 150 years in one case, had, had clung to the idea of being neutral, of not being part of military alliances. And suddenly there's, there's massive levels of, of popular support for joining NATO. And we see European countries led by Germany, which since World War II has refused to send weapons abroad, has refused to be a major military power, opposed famously the US war in Iraq. Suddenly, Germany announces that we are now going to spend 2% of our entire GDP on the military, something the US has been pressing for for years. And we're going to put 100 billion euros right into military production right now. You know, we now have an, an expansion of that kind of militarism. We have five European countries that have US controlled nuclear weapons on their territory. Uh, it's incredibly dangerous because the, the treaties that governed nuclear proliferation have pretty much been abandoned, mainly by the US, somewhat by Russia. And so the possibilities of moving towards arms control, abolition of nuclear weapons in the future is simply not on anybody's agenda because those agreements hardly exist anymore since Trump has pulled out of them and the US has not returned, has not made any effort to return. Now we know that that huge military spending doesn't work. We can just look at Ukraine, you know, those billions, hundreds of billions of dollars spent on the military was not enough to prevent the Russian invasion. So that clearly doesn't work. Spending more money on the military is not going to stop it. We do know that all wars eventually end with diplomacy. The question is how long do they go forward until the diplomacy finally starts to kick in? How many more people have to die, mainly Ukrainian civilians and soldiers and also Russian soldiers? How many more people have to die before there's a return to the early position of Zelensky's government and across Europe that there needs to be negotiations right away, there needs to be an immediate ceasefire. There were private assurances, there were public statements. Zelensky had agreed that NATO's, NATO membership for Ukraine was no longer on the agenda. All of these things were possible. What we're seeing now, and this is something that I think goes directly to our government and to our obligation as peace activists to challenge, is the notion that the US, among others, it's not the only one, but it's the most influential because it's, produce, it's providing the most weapons. The US is urging not to negotiate. It's urging to the, the, the Ukrainians themselves, instead of saying, we desperately need a ceasefire right now, they're saying, well, what we need is to defeat Russia. What we need is not so much about protecting Ukrainian lives as it is about weakening Russia. And that means it's gonna be much more difficult for Ukraine to get into the negotiating arena. We're not seeing a call, for example, to remobilize the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, the one diplomatic institution in Europe that is, a, that is for diplomacy and politics and not for the military. It's not NATO, it's not a European army effort. It's a diplomatic initiative that involves all the countries of Europe, including Russia and Ukraine, including Belarus and Poland, including all of Western Europe and Eastern and Central Europe. So it's exactly the kind of diplomatic instrument that could logically take the initiative to, to start negotiations, but that's not being allowed to happen as well. We desperately need those kinds of negotiations. We can't treat this as just one more war that should be ended because people are dying. 
The dangers of escalation make this so incredibly dangerous that the urgency is on a whole other level. The US needs to get out there and say that yes, sanctions that we have imposed on Russia will be lifted as soon as there's a ceasefire. Without that, we're stuck in the situation that the US caused in Iraq in 2004 and five and six, when they were paying the price for having maintained these sanctions before the, the war, when the US said to Saddam Hussein, hey, we don't really care at this point whether you allow in the inspectors or anything else. We're not going to lift the sanctions regardless. So there's no incentive for, in that case, the government to allow in UN inspectors. In this case, there's no incentive for Russia to do anything in terms of changing its practice unless it can be sure that it's going to get a lifting of sanctions when that happens. So we have a, a completely com complicated situation where there's two different voices coming from Washington, including from within the administration, with one side saying sanctions will end when the war ends or sanctions will end when there's a ceasefire, which is, in my view, the right thing to hear. But then we're also hearing from others saying sanctions can't be lifted until Russia's acts are, are insured as irreversible, which basically means you're never going to be able to lift sanctions until Russia is completely defeated, which is the dominant line at this moment in Russia. So all of these urgent needs for a ceasefire to stop the killing, to pull back the major weapons that are right now on the border fueling this, this is what we need to be talking about. We have to look towards the next steps, which involve making clear how, how diplomacy can go forward, what these, uh, uh, what these negotiations will have to look like. But then we have to go further than this. We have to look at what has happened in this war with the different levels of how this war is being viewed and how it's being treated in our own country. So we know that an enormous numbers of people in our country, particularly refugees, activists, people who have come, immigrants, people who have come from other parts of the world who are looking, and then people in other parts of the world, of course, as well, are looking at the incredible levels of hypocrisy and double standards in things like how this war is being reported, how the right of resistance and the right of self-determination is being treated in the Ukrainian case, as opposed to how it was treated vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Iraq, how it was treated vis-a-vis -vis Afghanistan, how it's treated vis-a-vis -vis Palestine. In all of those ways, the hypocrisy and double standard are absolutely enormous. And I think the anger that we're hearing from a lot of our friends is absolutely legitimate. But I also think we have to go beyond the anger. We have to look at this and say, this gives us the basis to say, this is the model that every war in the world, whether or not it's a direct US war where US soldiers might be at risk, every war should be covered 24 seven the way these wars are, this war is being covered. Meaning that the victims of the war are being humanized. We're getting these human stories of the, the lives of people who are being slaughtered in this war. It's so important. We should be getting that for every war. The question of the right of self-determination, the right of sovereignty, we should have been hearing about that from the media when the US invaded and overthrew the government of Afghanistan, and then again in Iraq. The right of resistance. You know, it was extraordinary. I don't know how many of you saw early on in the, I think it was in about maybe two or three weeks into the war, the BBC gave this huge explanation of how best to throw a Molotov cocktail at a Russian tank to maximize the number of Russian soldiers that would be killed within the tank. It was horrific on the one hand, but it was extraordinary to see this. Contrast that with the announcement of Israel at the moment that they're told that there's going to be a nonviolent Palestinian protest on Palestinian land, simply calling for an end to the blockade of Gaza. And they immediately say that we are going to answer that with snipers. And they carry that out. And 298 people are killed in a nonviolent protest. That's the right of return. Uh, sorry. That's the right of resistance that Palestinians are given to be met by snipers for a, against a nonviolent mobilization. In Ukraine, we have the BBC teaching people how to use Molotov cocktails to exercise their right of resistance. This is the model for how we need to be talking about 
what it means to be serious about human rights, all human rights for all people, and the refugees. There's enormous anger, again, at these incredible levels of hypocrisy and double standards, how Ukrainian refugees, the racism of it, how they are being welcomed at every border with hot soup and toys for the children and places to stay and new cell phones so they can start looking for work and rebuild their lives. On the one hand, it's an outrage that they're the only ones getting that kind of treatment. And it just happens that they're white. The people of color that were trying to get out of Ukraine over the border did not have that kind of a welcome. But the vast majority of Ukrainians did. And we have to get beyond the anger to say, that's exactly how every refugee should be treated. Refugees from Central America, refugees from Syria and Iraq, and refugees from Afghanistan and Somalia, all of the refugees in the world should be greeted at every border with hot soup and toys for their children, with doctors and homes to stay in, and families to take them in and say, we'll watch out for you for the first few years while you get settled here, and you're very welcome. We don't hear that for other refugees, but it's exactly how refugees should be treated. So I want to end with just a couple of things about our responses, the responses of, of our movements. I think that we do have to use these examples to, to say, no longer can we make the claim that it's just not possible to bring in this many refugees. It turns out that 5 million refugees fleeing Ukraine within two months have found safety. And the countries of Europe, which are not richer than the United States, managed to do that with really very little fuss and bother. It's the model of how refugees should be treated. Humanizing victims should be the model of how we respond to wars like this. So I think that when we, you know, when we look at the question of what's our job, our job is to push our own government to make clear its willingness to lift sanctions when the ceasefire happens, to demand that aid to Ukraine from the United States now be human humanitarian aid, development aid, economic aid, and no more military aid. There's plenty of military now. And I think there's also, there was a petition recently calling for a global, um, uh, a global arms boycott against Ukraine. And I didn't want to sign that because I think Ukraine does have a right of, uh, of, of uh, a right to fight back against an illegal occupation. I, I don't think that Ukraine was the kind of government that any of us paid much attention to. It was, a, was and remains a neoliberal, fairly repressive uh, government with, a, 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 with the presence of Nazi elements within its military. It's not a great government to write home about. But that doesn't mean that the country doesn't have the right of self-defense against its, an attack on its sovereignty. So I wasn't prepared to say that the Ukrainians should not have the right to get some weapons. But I do think that in the United States, we should be opposed to selling weapons or giving weapons to Ukraine any longer because of the consequences specifically of US militarism, which has been so dominant around the world. It gives the US far too much power it does not, as we know from other situations around the world, too common. We know that it does not lead to independence for these countries that are the recipients of massive amounts of U.S. weapons, U.S. training, U.S. domination militarily. So I have no problem in saying I don't think the U.S. should be sending more military equipment, even though I think it's, you know, I'm not going to say that, that the Ukrainians don't have the right to get it somewhere else. So it's a complicated war. It's not an easy war to understand. It's not an easy war to build opposition to. I think it is important that we know the history. We know how the U.S. has provoked these wars in over the last 30 or 40 or 50 years through, through the, the history and legacy of NATO. That's not new. We need to keep that in mind. And we need to recognize that all of that history, all of that provocation did not give Russia the right under international law to invade and occupy another country. So we have to hold those competing ideas in our minds and build a movement that's sophisticated enough to take that into account. So I'm glad to take more questions about things that our, our movement 
can and, and should do. We can go through some of the other provocations if people want to later. And I'll stop for now and look forward to seeing Zoltan's maps. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Phyllis. And, uh, we do have uh, Zoltan's maps uh, working now, so I'm going to uh, bring Zoltan back onto the screen, and uh, then I'll bring up the uh, the maps in just a second here as well. So again, welcoming uh, Zoltan Grossman, who is a member of the faculty at uh, the Evergreen State College in Olympia, Washington. So can you see the uh, map now? Okay, great. Well, thank you, Norm, um, and greetings to all uh, friends in Wisconsin and beyond. As a geographer, um, I'm going to give a little bit of background, geographic historical background on Ukraine. I try not to think of Ukraine as just a piece on a geopolitical chessboard, but as a place with its own rich ethnic diversity. Ukraine actually means borderland not a fixed boundary, but a zone of mixture between two nations or cultures, much like the Southwest is a transition zone between Anglo-America and Latin America. Ukraine is a transition zone between Western Europe and Russia. How we treat refugees differently in those two borderlands says a lot about the West double standards. Political military maps tend to show unitary states without showing their crucial internal regions. I wanna stop with the, start with this key map which shows the swath of Russian speakers in red in Eastern and Southern Ukraine, the far West Ukrainian speaking region in yellow, and a central Russian Ukrainian region in orange of mixed towns and families and individuals who speak a hybrid dialect. We'll see this map shaping everything since independence. And the map itself is shaped by past border changes. There've been so many border changes that a man, let's call him Ivan, shown by the red letter I, could have been born in the Austro-Hungarian Empire before World War I, grown up in Czechoslovakia after World War I, fought for Hungary in World War II, allied with the German Reich that also occupied Ukraine, grew old in the Soviet Union after World War II, and poor Ivan died in Ukraine after 1991, all without leaving his hometown in Transcarpathia. The history of Ukraine can't just be reduced to the brief Soviet period, but is the legacy of multiple empires stretching back centuries, in particular, the expansive Russian empire that the Soviets inherited. Russian imperial consciousness was shaped by armed competition from rival empires, the Swedes, French and Germans from the West, the Turks and British from the South. Putin idolizes Peter the Great's conquests and settler colonialism. After the 1917 Russian Revolution, Vladimir Lenin began a policy of national self-determination to roll back the empire's great Russian chauvinism. Lenin detached part of Russia to give to Ukraine in 1922, which is now the Russian-speaking region of the East and South. Putin still resents this because he sides with Stalin, who reversed that policy after Lenin's death. Between the world wars, the far west Galicia region around Lviv in yellow was part of Poland. In Ukrainian national consciousness, the first defining trauma was the Holodomor, or Great Famine imposed by Stalin in the 1930s, in which at least 4 million died. It figured in Ukrainian resentment much like the British-induced famine in Ireland. Because of this experience, some Ukrainians, like some white Russians, initially welcomed the 1941 Nazi invasion. But not all, because about 3.5 million Ukrainians fought on the Soviet side in the war the main historical trauma. Fascist leader Stepan Bandera's Ukrainian insurgent army had welcomed the Nazis and slaughtered Jews and Poles in Galicia to create a pure Ukrainian state. Bandera wanted to lead Ukraine as a Nazi puppet state, but the Nazis viewed all Slavs as subhuman and wanted their fertile land for German settlers. The Germans had studied American westward expansion and ethnic cleansing as a precedent for their eastward expansion. So Bandera's insurgents fought both the Soviets and the Germans, and they kept fighting to 1952. They were backed by the CIA, 
to fight the new communist enemy. So Ukraine is divided by historical traumas. Many Ukrainians view Russia through the lens of Tsarist and Stalinist atrocities. Many Russians view Ukraine through the lens of Nazi atrocities and Western threats. The ultra-nationalism of each side feeds on the other, so they need each other to legitimize their own militancy. But often overlooked is the other history of inter-ethnic cooperation, intermarriages, and shared grievances about corrupt elites. After the war, Europe was divided between NATO and the Warsaw Pact. NATO did not represent democracy, since some of its members, then and now, are authoritarian, but it was a capitalist bloc to contain communism. An important moment in the Cold War was the 1956 Hungarian Revolution, in which a democratic communist government challenged Stalinism and was supported by a broad base from left to right, and most countries. The rebels asked for NATO backing, but Eisenhower didn't want to risk World War III. Many Hungarians died or fled, but Hungary and Poland are where the Warsaw Pact later began to unravel. Another important moment was the enormous early 80s movement against NATO and Soviet deployment of medium-range missiles, which put Europe on a hair-trigger alert. I visited the peace camps at missile bases in Britain and West Germany and spoke with Soviet bloc peace dissidents. A million people rallied against the missiles in New York, and Reagan and Gorbachev withdrew them in a treaty which Trump recently tore up. This is the map I and many of you grew up with of the 15 republics inside the Soviet Union centered on Russia, and it broke up in 1991 into 15 independent states. Ukrainians voted 90% for independence as Ukraine, not the Ukraine, which denotes a region. They were recognized by Russia, gave up their nukes, and got security guarantees from Moscow. The economic alliance of the European Union expanded eastward, which Moscow mainly saw as economic competition, but at the same time, NATO expanded eastward into the former Warsaw Pact. New NATO bases were seen as a threat not just by Russian autocrats, but also by Democrats, who preferred a neutral zone between NATO and Russia, and Moldova did stay neutral. In some ways, Putin and NATO need each other to scare their own people. Of course, when the U.S. thought revolutionary Mexico might ally with Germany in World War I, it invaded Mexico. When Cuba allied with Moscow, the U.S. launched the Bay of Pigs invasion, so the U.S. has its own history of fearing its neighbors joining rival military blocs. In only a few years, the map of Europe changed from this to this, and it could have kept going. At the time, I was a professional cartographer in Madison, in charge of tracking place name changes for Encyclopedia Britannica and other clients. My list of name changes was published in the New York Times, inspiring a New Yorker humorist to write an account of meeting a fictional me. But my map of ethnic republics within the new post-Soviet states was published, including Abkhazia, Crimea, and Chechnya. The Chechen Muslims declared their own independence and beat the Russian army. In 1999, Prime Minister Putin blamed a series of mysterious apartment bombings on Chechens, and he launched a brutal invasion of Chechnya, flattening its capital of Grozny, killing Chechens and ethnic Russians alike. This was popular in Russia and made Putin president. Western politicians also enabled his slaughter of Muslims. They almost never mention his first war crimes. But the big question after the Soviet breakup Hello? Oh, slide's not advancing, okay. So Norm, uh, at what point? I'm going to stop sharing and go back in. It seems like there's the same problem as earlier. I think it might actually be a problem with the PowerPoint. Um, if you uh, if you go back and do the uh, 
the PowerPoint function where you show it as a slideshow and then advance um, between the slides. I think. Um, I think. How is work. that? How is that? Can you see that, uh, Norm? Yes, we can see that. Okay, great. So I'll just. Um, it must have frozen somehow. Uh, but the big question after the Soviet breakup was the 25 million Orthodox Russians left outside Russia. There were fears they would want to separate and join Russia, but most did not. This is in contrast to the subsequent breakup of Yugoslavia into seven countries, where Orthodox Serbs were left outside Serbia in Croatia and Bosnia. The parallel to Chechnya in Russia was the Muslim region of Kosovo in Serbia. The Yugoslav Wars of the 90s is where we get the term ethnic cleansing, turning a messy mixed ethnic region into clean political borders through massive violent removals. There are two parallels for Russians left outside Russia. In Moldova, a Romanian-speaking former Soviet Republic, a thin Russian border region declared independence as Transnistria, and there are still Russian peacekeeping forces stationed there. And in Ukraine, about 17% of the population is ethnic Russian, concentrated in the Far East Donbass and forming a majority in Crimea and the South since Stalin's removal of Turkic-speaking Tatars and the 1954 gifting of Crimea to Ukraine. These imprints of past history all shape 21st century events in Ukraine, starting with the 2004 election. Keep in mind the language map of the Russian speakers in red, though remembering that many ethnic Ukrainians speak Russian at home. Much like many Mexican Americans, Irish, Scots, Welsh speak the colonizer's language of English, but can still be proud and nationalistic. Also remember the far west Ukrainian era, and this history is perfectly represented on the election maps, with the Ukrainian nationalist Yushchenko winning in the far west region, the pro-Russian Yanukovych winning the east and splitting the difference in the middle. Yanukovych also sold out the rival empire of the US by sending troops to Iraq. Yushchenko called for joining the EU and to bring the troops home from Iraq. After the 2004 Orange Revolution in Kiev's Maidan Square, he became president for five years but tried to rehabilitate Bandera, which was very unpopular as fascist groups were still very small. In another so-called colored revolution the same year in Georgia, another more democratic but more nationalist president fueled opposition from two min ethnic minority regions, Abkhazia and South Ossetia, which seceded and called in Russian peacekeepers. So are we having the same problem? Uh, sorry. Norm, are we having the same problem? Yes, it's um, I think you have to press each slide in order to um, to get them to to show there because they're not advancing as you're going along. Oh, OK. I don't know what you mean by press each slide. Well, Whatever you do to select, I mean, you've got one showing now that you selected, but then you'll have to select the next one after it in the same way that you got this one to show. Okay. Um, maybe I could just advance uh, in this format? Yes. Okay. Then I will do that. Okay. In 2008, uh, Russia defeated Georgian forces. In, uh, can you see that, Norm? Yes. Okay. In 2010 in Ukraine, Yushchenko's VP ran against Yanukovych and lost, but the map was exactly the same. As she won the West, he won the East, especially Crimea and Donbass, and they split the middle. Both of the candidates were magnates in the natural gas industry, and Ukraine is the conduit for Russian gas pipelines, with Russia paying high tariffs and seeking alternate routes. Seeking energy independence, Ukraine is opening its own rich Black Sea coast gas deposits to fracking, as some other European states have banned fracking. Yanukovych took Ukraine in a very pro-Moscow direction and was incredibly corrupt and brutal. He stimulated a rise in Ukrainian ultranationalism, including celebrating the Ukrainian insurgent army. But even then, the far-right party only got 11% of the 2012 parliamentary vote, 
almost all around Lviv, much lower than far-right parties in some other European countries. In 2014, a broad-based uprising drew rightists and leftists alike back to Maidan Square. About 30% of the protesters were far-right, and that means 70% of them weren't. I wrote an article uh, warning human rights advocates not to overlook the Ukrainian far-right threat. I was disturbed by the far-right symbols, not only from European fascist history, but from the global white power movement. The fascist party Svoboda had not won many votes, but the anti-EU party somehow wormed its way into the pro-EU uprising. And the Nazi group Right Sector, which in its propaganda videos openly opposes Western democracy and homosexuality, much like Putin, provided some of the militant street fighters who drove Yanukovych into exile in Moscow. I was most disturbed that for a brief period, Svoboda became part of the revolutionary government, approved by the State Department and IMF. That government renamed streets and built monuments to Bandera and other fascists. Even the U.S. grew concerned about the armed Ukrainian fascist groups who have trained far-right militants from North America and Europe, enabling possible blowback. At the same time, Putin was aiding similar far-right parties throughout Europe. Russian far-right groups have also been training foreign mercenaries. The fascist ideologue Alexander Dugin has influence in the military, urging it to liberate ethnic Russians. The fascists on both sides feed off of each other to reinforce their legitimacy. My message in 2014 was the enemy of your enemy is not always your friend. Aiding Afghan rebels against the Soviets led to 9-11. In Yugoslavia, the U.S. opposed ethnic cleansing by Serbian enemies, but enabled it by Croatian allies. And in Syria and Libya, Arab Spring uprisings against secular dictators were hijacked by al-Qaeda militants. American binary thinkers across the spectrum want to see only good guys versus bad guys, when it's often bad guys versus bad guys, and two wrongs don't make a right. In 2014, Russia annexed Crimea after 60 years, which was very popular among Russians. Like Western politicians, Putin used war and xenophobia to deflect attention from a growing economic crisis at home. Ethnic Russians in the eastern Donbass, which in the Soviet era was the center of coal and steel country, also agitated for secession of the Luhansk and Donetsk regions. Their movement was quickly hijacked by militant Russian armed groups who, whose far-right politics were the mirror image of the Ukrainian ultranationalists. There was a moment of hope when the chocolate king Petro Poroshenko won all regions on an anti-corruption platform, but he turned out to be very corrupt and went very far to the right, and the next election map just reflected the same old divisions. Poroshenko began to coalesce the far-right activists in the National Guard as the Azov Battalion, who could be a coup threat. Congress banned aid to Azov, but the Pentagon has been ignoring the ban. The 2019 election was a rebuke to ultranationalists on both sides. Not only is Zelensky a Jewish Russian speaker himself, but he decisively won the Russian region, and Poroshenko only won the far-right stronghold around Lviv. So to Russian-speaking Ukrainians, it makes no sense at all that Putin's denazification would be directed against the candidate they voted for in large numbers, and Ukrainian nationalists did not. Nevertheless, the war in eastern Donbass continued, killing about 14,000, mostly by shelling from both sides. Last fall, Zelensky feared a far-right coup, and so stepped away from the means peace process. Now most Western observers assume P Putin's invasion had the goal of conquering the whole country. But even he knows that he'd face urban warfare after occupying Kyiv, and an insurgency in the West would be supplied by NATO from Poland, like the Afghan rebels were supplied from Pakistan, and he'd lose. The only thing for sure is a self-fulfilling prophecy. His invasion has elevated both the far right and NATO. I think Putin's endgame has not been regime change, but partition. To take back <clears throat> the Russian-speaking area of Ukraine that Lenin attached to it one century ago. He has called that swath Novorossiya, or New Russia. He wants to bite off that region rather than swallow the country whole and depopulate the resource-rich region through triggering the refugee crisis and forced removals. If you look at the language map and toggle it with Russian military advances, you see a perfect correlation with the red Russian-speaking area. Putin is building a land bridge from Donbass to Crimea and westward along the gas-rich Black Sea coast to Odessa and the Russian enclave of Transnistria and Moldova, 
He has seized Kherson, where he is trying to engineer a fourth secession, consistent only with a partition plan. Some military observers now see that partition was always the goal. Putin has also occupied southern Zaporizhia and rest western Luhansk, and is now trying to take western Donetsk. He has failed to take Mykolaiv and Odessa, perhaps saving them for a future war. It took two wars each for the Israelis to occupy Palestine and the U.S. to occupy Iraq. Partition would be difficult because Russian speakers have been greeting his troops not with flowers, like Bush thought we'd get in Iraq, but with grenades. If partition is successful, what would happen to the smaller rump Ukraine? The far right would probably oust or sideline Zelensky and join NATO, but Putin could claim he's created a buffer security area, and he could continue to scare Russians with Nazis in NATO, because his main goal is to control his own unhappy people and stay in power through fear. As we can see with the examples of British Ireland, India, and Palestine, and the U.S. internal division of Iraq into sectarian regions, partitions do not bring peace, but guarantee continued war for decades. I'm actually afraid of Russia and NATO agreeing to internally divide Ukraine. The 1995 Dayton Accords internally divided Bosnia into an Orthodox Serb Republic and Muslim Croat Federation, rubber stamping the ethnic cleansing of mixed regions in the Bosnian War and creating a clean white political border that still threatens to erupt in conflict. I fear the Serb Republic might become a model for Novorossiya. If you look at these four maps together, it's clear that the multi-ethnic mixture of Ukraine is threatened by partition. If you believe that Putin's goal was to conquer all of Ukraine, then it looks like the Russians have lost the war. But if you believe his goal was partition, then despite Russian military incompetence, he's won most of his goals through brute force. Like in Korea, I doubt there'll be any peace agreement because the battle lines will just harden in the stalemate. I much prefer this solution where the Ukrainian and Russian people, soldiers and civilians alike, realize that war is not in their interest and join to throw out their corrupt elites. I'd like to finish by commenting on the debate among U.S. progressives, dominated on one hand by so-called tankies who feel that because the Russians are against U.S. imperialism, they can do no wrong, and what I call dronies who feel that because the U.S. is against Russian imperialism, it can do no wrong. Both sides in this endless debate have a double standard that highlights human rights atrocities by their enemies and never their own side. But I have some hope that the Americans who have been horrified by the atrocities against civilians in Ukraine, that some can be convinced to transfer their empathy to refugees from Honduras and Haiti, or to Yemenis and Palestinians facing U.S. weapons. Opposition to Russia's invasion has been very broad-based across the ideological spectrum. There's a huge danger of that near consensus being manipulated into support for war. There's a qualitative difference between demanding that Russia not use its regional strength to bully other countries and demanding that Russia becomes a weak power. Russia's military ineptness shows it is hardly a long-term threat to NATO. But in earlier eras, a sense of moral triumphalism as a revulsion to an event in the global north has propelled the U.S. into disastrous wars in the global south. The Hungarian rebels were treated as the good guys in 1956. But this American sense of superiority fueled the first attacks on Vietnam and Cuba in their early 60s. The 1989 fall of the Berlin Wall contributed to an American hubris that was directed at Iraq in the 1991 Gulf War. And we all know that 9-11 led to the invasions of Afghanistan and of Iraq, which had nothing to do with it. I fear that the Pentagon's moral triumphalism in Ukraine will open the door to more wars, whether against Syria, Iran, North Korea, or especially China over Taiwan. The Palestinian poet Mahmoud Darwish wrote, the war will end, the leaders will shake hands, the old woman will keep waiting for her martyred son, that girl will wait for her beloved husband, and those children will wait for their hero father. I don't know who sold our homeland, but I saw who paid the price. Here are some of my articles and maps that I could drop into the chat. And thank you for listening, and apologies for any technical problems. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Sultan, very much. And, and I'm sorry for the uh, for the technical glitches there, but um, a very, very powerful uh, collection of slides and images. Um, I'm going to bring Phyllis back into the conversation and uh, 
at this point, um, we have uh, we have some questions uh, that um, were uh, talked about ahead of time that that you have um, already received by email, and then we also have some questions that are coming in now from the uh, from the chat. So I encourage people to uh, to use the chat either in uh, Facebook or um, in uh, YouTube to send us uh, to send us your questions. Um, the first question uh, is about NATO and the um, the NATO meeting, of course, going on right now, uh, the 28th, 29th, and 30th in uh, Madrid. And the question to both of you is: What do you think of the Scandinavian countries that want to uh, join NATO? You know, I think it's a very dangerous um, moment that we're seeing right now. It's dangerous both at the immediate level of having two wealthy, stable, powerful countries with strong militaries, although they've never been willing to join a, 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 a military alliance of any sort, Sweden and Finland. Sweden in particular is a very uh, big arms exporter. Finland has a, a, a stronger history as a, excuse me, as a neutral country. And it is, as I think I mentioned earlier, it's, it's very disturbing seeing not only the, the government forces or the militaries in both those countries urging uh, their countries to join NATO, but it's become instantly overwhelmingly popular in both. There's huge majorities, 75, 80% majorities uh, supporting becoming part of NATO. Um, I think it's it's very it's very sad, but it also there's some immediate dangers because it really consolidates U.S. Uh, um, influence, military influence in Europe. Um, the U.S. is what controls what they like to call the interoperability principle with NATO, and essentially that means is that NATO members have to agree they have to agree to a bunch of stuff. And it, it won't happen. It's part of the reason that it takes a while for a country, a new member to, to actually join. But one of the things that they have to do is agree that their military, their military equipment, their tanks, their planes, their bombs have to be compatible with the NATO systems, which are, surprise, surprise, U.S.-based. And secondarily, there's a little bit of European uh, uh, stuff in there. So... Any country that has had military purchases from somewhere else is in trouble because that won't necessarily be interoperable with NATO's. So it consolidates the power of U.S. military producers, U.S. military corporations, whose CEOs, of course, make more money than almost any other set of CEOs in the United States. Uh, it gives them enormous more power because they'll, these new members will have to buy a bunch of new equipment, a bunch of new tanks, a bunch of new submarines, a bunch of new planes, who knows what. But we know that that money is going to come back to these corporations and the U.S. military will emerge even stronger across Europe. So I think that's a huge problem. The other problem, of course, is that it's going to seriously undermine the economic stability of European countries who already are facing uh, much higher inflation than we are here, uh, more than twice as much as our, our rates in, in some countries. And what this means is that the what Europe, what Western Europe in particular, but Europe as a whole has been known for, which is decent jobs, good standard of living, national health care, all the things that we have been organizing here for for years and still don't have, uh, all those things will be in jeopardy for the same reasons that we're told we can't have Medicare for all or a Green New Deal because there's no money. Well, there's plenty of money. The question is, where's the money going? Right now, the money is going 52% 52 uh, 52 is going directly to the military. So what a surprise that we don't have money for health care. The Europeans are now going to be facing that same kind of crisis. And in countries like Germany or, or Sweden, where you have you know, a history of really powerful trade unions, really powerful social movements that with, with strong social safety nets, all of that is now at risk in a whole new way because they're going to be spending so much more money uh, on the military. So it's a very dangerous reality that we're facing here. Zoltan, other thoughts on that question? 
Yeah, I'd say if you go back to the Soviet breakup period, it was, it's remarkable how many of even George H.W. Bush's advisors were warning against NATO expansion as uh, provoking Russia. People like Brent Scowcroft, Jim Baker, later uh, Robert Gates, the CIA director of it was it was widely known um, that this was uh, going to uh, create friction. And uh, I'd say that, that that lasts to the present day. I mean, Sweden and, join, and Finland joining NATO, Sweden doesn't share a border with Russia. It's often complained about Russian subs in the Baltic Sea, um, but Finland shares a long border uh, with Russia and a history of warfare, um, the Russo-Finnish War, and a region adjacent in Russia called Karelia, that could potentially be a flashpoint um, between Russia and the West if Finland is part of NATO. So um, in trying to solve one problem, uh, the US is compounding a whole set of new problems. And that has tended to be the pattern in our military and foreign policy, uh, very short-sighted and, um, and not really looking at the larger vision that has been uh, there for, for decades of a united common European home from Atlantic to the, uh, from the Atlantic to the Urals uh, that could be largely demilitarized, that no longer is a flashpoint for nuclear war um, to involve Russia in, uh, in security um, uh, uh, systems um, and, and Nazi clash uh, between the two uh, parts of Europe as inevitable. And I think a lot of these have become self-fulfilling prophecies. And by the way, we have a piece going up on our website tomorrow by Medea Benjamin and Nicholas J.S. Davies that talks about some of that NATO history and about those warnings uh, that you mentioned, Zoltan, including links to uh, to some of the um, uh, statements uh, that were made by those advisors to the U.S. president uh, at the time. That's uh, at progressive.org on the web. Um, Phyllis, taking off from what you were saying about the, uh, the military, I mean, one of the things that we've certainly seen uh, over the last uh, couple of months now is the U.S. has been providing uh, material military weaponry to the uh, Ukrainian government is that they're taking that out of stockpiles that they had here in the United States that now is going to, are going to have to be replenished. So this whole thing has really been kind of a bonanza for uh, defense contractors because not only do they get to make a bunch more stuff, but they get to uh, get rid of all their old stuff without having to figure out how to dispose of it. So it's... Um, it's really a, a, a for the military contractors a win-win in in several different ways. Um, I wonder, you know, is there anything that that we as the uh, as the peace movement can and should be doing to uh, to be pressuring our elected officials to look at this uh, exchange the way it's playing out? You know, this is a very very difficult moment for that. Uh, I was recently at a a meeting that included several members of the Progressive Caucus who have all been um, pretty strong on opposing um, escalations of the military budget, that sort of thing. And I asked, I said, you know, in this moment when so much money, so many arms, so much of everything is going to the war in Ukraine and it's seeming to make it worse, um, what can we do to help you stand firm against that? And their answer was essentially, we don't think we can right now. We don't think we can stand against this. And we saw that with the, the unanimity of, of Democrats, right-wing and left-wing Democrats, and, and the vast majority of centrists, uh, all voting for that $40 billion, of which half was going directly to the military, which means directly to the military contractors, because as you say, they are now going to be getting contracts to replace all the things coming out of these stockpiles. So it, it's very dangerous. I think one of the things we can be doing is the expose side of things here. You know, the, the fact that those $40 billion is not even included in these military budgets. We're hearing the, the justification for escalating the military budget. You know, this is not even what the military asked for. The military asked, asked the White House for, I, I don't remember the exact numbers, but significantly less than what the president ultimately asked for. The president asked for about, I think it was 813 
billion dollars. The military had asked for about 800 billion. The president said, oh, we'll give you a little more. We'll give you say 813. And now Congress is jumping onto that and saying, well, we'll give you more than that. We're gonna bring it up to $847 billion. But you also have this reality that the, the leaders, the CEOs, the board chairs or whatever of the military contractors, they knew about this ahead of time and they were bragging about it to their, uh, their shareholders. So there's a report, I believe it was the CEO of Boeing who said to his shareholders back in around December, January, where there were tensions on the border, but several months before the war actually began, it might've been November, uh, before the Russians had actually invaded Ukraine, uh, he spoke at this shareholder meeting and said, you know, we've been getting a little worried about the impact of the end of the war in Afghanistan, because of course that was where we were getting a lot of money, long pause, but we're seeing some good news from Eastern Europe. What is this? Good news, the slaughter of more people, because that's our, that's our blood money. That's where we make our fortunes. So I think that kind of expose becomes very important. I think we have to be demanding more from Congress, but understanding we're not going to get that right now. So we have to have alternative goals as well. Um, you know, it's, it's fine to be holding them accountable, but we don't bring to the table either the votes or the money that sway members of Congress, even the progressive ones. So we have to acknowledge that and figure out other things to do, which goes to the question of building movements that can change the political discourse. There's a saying in Washington about must pass bills. And often you'll hear somebody talk about some amendment that will be attached to a must pass bill. And that's how they manage. It happened some years back with John, um, uh, oh, why am I blocking his name? Who ran for president, right wing from Arizona? McCain. McCain, thank you. John McCain attached to the annual uh, NDAA, the, the defense bill, the defense appropriations bill, a small bill, small amendment that, re that required the state of Arizona and the federal government to sell to a giant Canadian co uh, copper company a swath of land to build a new copper mine that surrounded the holiest site of the Apache stronghold. And that case is still in the courts years later, but it passed easily because it was attached to something known as the quote, must pass bill. Our job looking longer term, not this week, not this year, but longer term is to create the kind of political pressure so that whatever is the must pass bill, it's about vaccines. It's about the child tax credit, that those become the must pass bills rather than the defense appropriation bill. Right now, that's the only must pass bill. That's what we've got to change. Uh, another question that we have that's come in is about food security concerns. And of course, um, Ukraine uh, is a huge producer of, uh, of wheat. It, uh, it has been uh, uh, for as long as uh, any of us can remember, it was an issue in uh, uh, during the time of the Soviet Union. It's an issue now, um, particularly in the Middle East and North Africa, where that wheat is uh, is consumed by people. And so, I wonder if if each of you could talk about um, the impacts of the of the war on food security, and also, of course, you know, it's going on during I think during the spring planting season right now. So uh, it's gonna, Im the impact is gonna continue uh, even if the uh, actual shooting war stopped uh, very soon, the impact of this is gonna continue on. Yeah, yeah. at least 70% of the uh, wheat going to poorer countries comes from Ukraine and uh, Russia, off um, much of it through the port of Odessa, which is why one of the reasons that Odessa is so important in this war. Uh, the head of the UN's uh, food agency, the World Food Program, David Beasley, says this can be, this can create a hell on earth uh, for so many people in conflict zones uh, such as Yemen, uh, such as Ethiopia. Have to remember the um, Arab Spring uprisings were uh, 
uh, triggered partly uh, by food price, by bread uh, uh, price rises. And so uh, in places like Egypt, um, uh, for instance, uh, this can create some real political um, instability. And, um, you know, this is where the UN really should be stepping up. I mean, this is not something that NATO is has any wherewithal to do anything about. But, you know, if there was some way for uh, the countries of the world outside of NATO to basically say, no, we want some kind of way to escort uh, these grain ships. You know, the U.S. escorted um, reef packed Kuwaiti tankers during um, uh, the uh, or before, around the time of the Iran Iraq war. I remember that. And so why can't uh, the UN be involved in escorting uh, uh, ships carrying food? Um, and it really shows the bankruptcy both of NATO and and the UN at this time of emergency. But really, um, uh, figures I've seen going from 80 million uh, people in need to about 325 million, the ability to feed uh some of these countries is one third lower now than it was on february 23rd so um this is a real disaster in the making that's absolutely right the only thing i would add is that this is happening at a time when we're also seeing uh massive levels of climate caused uh food shortages and droughts in a whole host of areas around the world heat waves that are destroying crops droughts that are preventing crops from growing and if we look, for example, at Afghanistan, which is in the midst of one of the worst humanitarian disasters, second only to, to Yemen, and I'm not sure it hasn't already passed Yemen at this point, um, the, the, the drought in, in uh, Afghanistan, coupled with the complete sudden withdrawal of all foreign aid, coupled with the U.S. seizure of the last $9 billion of money belonging to the people of Afghanistan, which was being held in, in New York banks and is now frozen and inaccessible to Afghanistan because the U.S. doesn't like its government, which most people don't like its government. We don't like a lot of governments, but we don't seize their, uh, seize their, their, um, their national wealth, which is what we've done. The numbers of people, it's now at 95%, according to the United Nations, who are somewhere between food insecure and starving. And that means primarily children. So the, the humanitarian consequences of this war on the global level, it's one of the reasons that I was trying to target this question of why this war is so much more dangerous globally than all of the horrific wars that the US has waged since World War II because of the direct global consequences ranging from the, the threat of a nuclear exchange to the continuing uh, uh, question of food shortages environmental catastrophe caused by extra drilling for fossil fuels, the whole range of things, plus increased militarization around the world. So it's a disaster and needs to be brought to an end urgently. And you touch on this next question, actually, which is about the fact that efforts to uh, combat climate change have been stalled, derailed, or displaced by this war, including uh, Germany's move away from fossil fuels and uh, certainly the attention of uh, many, many people here in the United States to the issue of, of uh, the climate crisis. Um, yeah. Uh, each of you, if you could talk a little bit more about that that issue. Well, there's a whole host of ways that the, the climate is is emerging here. I mean, we're seeing it in, in France, which is being talked about as one of the countries in Europe that's the least impacted so far. Well, why is that? It's because they put aside any effort to get rid of their reliance on nuclear energy, which is what they've been relying on. And there's been a move in France slowly, but it's been happening to challenge that and to move towards renewables and saying that that uh, nuclear energy is not a legitimate renewable form of energy. Uh, that's now off the table. The French are quite happy to say, well, we don't have to buy Russian oil. You know, we're going to keep the pressure on. Well, that's fine, but it's not fine because they're relying on this incredibly dangerous form of, uh, of, of, um, uh, of, of energy source to begin with. So the whole range of things that is leading to greater climate crises in the midst of natural climate crises because of all of the person-made uh, destruction of the environment that we're already seeing. So all of this is happening at once. And the, uh, the impact of this in terms of the, the, these rapid efforts to replace 
uh, access to, to sufficient oil and natural gas without relying on Russian oil or natural gas is leading to things that are disastrous politically and from the vantage point of human rights, like the, the, uh, the, the, um, the, the claim that suddenly Saudi Arabia is our buddy again, and it doesn't matter that they've murdered journalists and oppressed women and are waging this horrific war in, in Yemen. None of that matters. Uh, but it's also the immediate impact of this kind of a war that is so destructive to the environment. Yeah, it's one of the things that's the most mind-blowing about the, the reaction is um, your Western European reliance on Russian oil and gas. You would think would be a wake-up call that perhaps we shouldn't be uh, relying on fossil fuels and on these kind of tenuous uh, supply lines um, that both, uh, you know, destroy the environment and national sovereignty. Um, but instead, you see the West doubling down on oil and gas and this overture to Saudi Arabia, which is so flying in the face of the, of the whole message that the war, uh, the defense of Ukraine is about the defense of human rights and democracy. Uh, when in order to cozy up to another uh, dictatorship, um, that's the way to uh, bypass uh, dependence on Russian oil. So uh, we also have to remember that the militaries of the world are the number one emitters of carbon. And so especially, ours. Yeah, especially the Uni United States military. And so the more military activity, um, the more carbon emissions, the more climate change. And so you know, people ask, uh, do you support an oil embargo on Russia? I say, sure, I support an oil embargo on all countries. Um, this is, uh, a, a, should be a real wake up call um, that war and oil uh, are two sides of the same coin. And uh, if we're dependent on oil, uh, if we're dependent on natural gas, um, it's just going to spark or exacerbate future wars. One um, last question, and then I'm going to ask you also both to transition into uh, closing comments. But uh, the, the, um, the question reads, political leaders are threatening the use of nuclear weapons and talking about this as a practical option. And in some cases, the media has even echoed this uh, uh, language. Um, what uh, can we do to step away from the brink of this nuclear threat uh, that is um, uh, on the horizon if this war continues or if um, uh, perhaps if Russia's um, uh, chips go down in the fighting uh, moving forward? Well, I think one thing we can do is keep reminding everybody we talk to, write for, speak at whatever communication capacity we have of the danger of a nuclear exchange coming out of this, uh, coming out of this, this war. I think it's important to recognize that probably the least likely scenario in which that could happen is that one or the other side, Russia has made more direct threats, but the U.S. has long held that, you know, military uses of nuclear weapons are there for a reason, that sort of thing. But that if they're, that the least likely way is that one or the other side will decide to use a nuclear weapon. I think that's pretty unlikely. Not impossible, again, but tiny, tiny chance. The far greater chance is the kind of escalation that happens in wars that you cannot control. So for example, in Syria, the US and Russia, who were of course supporting opposite sides, had a hotline set up so that if they were going to go bombing somewhere, they would call, the U.S. would call the Russian commander and say, look, we've got planes heading for X. Get your people out of there. We don't want to kill your people. We don't care if we kill Syrians, but we don't want to kill Russians because that could escalate things. The Russians did the same thing. And that was used a number of times. It's still in place in Syria. It's not in place in Ukraine. There is no system set up for that. So imagine out on, you know, near Odessa or out in the Black Sea or, or somewhere, you have in the middle of the night, there's some tired young soldier on patrol and sees a, a flare of some sort and says, oh my God, we're under attack. I better respond. And in, instinct kicks in. This particular soldier is trained better than some of them and has an instinct that when you're under attack, you fire back or whatever it is they say they're supposed to do. And he does that. 
And then she realizes, oh my God, this was this was not even, this was a flare, this wasn't anything. And now I've sparked a whole escalation. There's no way to call that back. The US and the Russians don't have any setup right now where somebody can call the other side and say, we just made a big mistake, pull back, pull back, this is not an escalation, et cetera, et cetera. Those kinds of things work, but it doesn't exist. And that's when you get to escalation that can lead far too quickly to a nuclear exchange. So I think talking about that and and in a visceral way about what is the danger that we really face in this war, this week, this month, today, this isn't some future when the clock gets turned all the way up to 12, you know, it was 12 minutes to midnight or whatever. We're right there. We're there. We're at midnight. And we need to be talking about that. And Accountability is key. We should be pushing the United States to join the UN Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Right now, we don't even have a serious part- level of participation in the, the only existing remaining treaty at all, which is the Non-Proliferation Treaty. that says in Article 6 that the obligation of the nuclear weapon states are, in, are including the need to move towards full and complete nuclear disarmament, abolition. You say that to a member of the State Department and they look at you and they laugh and they say, we don't take that seriously. We never took that seriously. That wasn't designed to be taken seriously. And you say, well, excuse me, but we take it seriously. And they're like, yeah, well, who are you? So we have to keep up reminding people that these are binding obligations and that without them, we are at risk of having a real nuclear war and that it's not just some rhetorical flourish at this point. And I agree uh, with Phyllis that the chances of the use of nuclear weapons are quite small in Ukraine. I think, unfortunately, the use of chemical weapons is more likely um, uh, in these kinds of um, really brutal World War I type uh, scenarios. Um, But I think what's partly being talked about is the use of tactical nuclear weapons, Mm -hmm. small nuclear weapons. And the U.S. really only has to blame itself. Uh, for the proliferation of tactical nuclear weapons, because the idea is that they narrowed the gap, the threshold between going from very, very large conventional weapons to small nuclear weapons. It made it easier, especially in the scenario of um, uh, Soviet Soviet invasion of West Germany, to destroy the Soviet tanks without taking out the German cities around them. And so the U.S. got smaller and smaller and smaller, and the Russians have followed suit in recent years. And so you have these tactical nuclear weapons, which are just horrific, that should be banned. Uh, On top of that, um, Trump did uh, tear up the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty uh, that um, halted the deployment of medium-range missiles. That allows that deployment, that arms race in Europe, putting Europe on a hair trigger, first strike alert um, uh, again. And so I think one of the demands of the movement would be to bring that back that INF treaty. That's not a a concession to the Russians. You make nuclear weapons deals with your enemies, not with your friends. And so the fact that there's more tension between the U.S. and Russia these days is a reason to double down on the effort to um, uh, protect um, the world from nuclear weapons. So... Okay. Well, I think we're almost out of time here, but uh, ask you both for uh, for any closing comments. Again, I want to uh, thank everybody that uh, that made this um, event possible. Again, our uh, sponsoring organizations: uh, Code Pink, Madison Veterans for Peace, uh, the Madison Working Group on Peace in Ukraine. Physicians for Social Responsibility of Wisconsin, the Safe Skies Clean Water Coalition, the Madison Area Democratic Socialists of America, and the Madison Branch of Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. And uh, again, hosting this event, uh, the Progressive Magazine, you can check out all of our uh, stories online at progressive.org. Phyllis Bennis of the Institute for Policy Studies and Zoltan Grossman of the Evergreen State College in uh, Olympia, Washington. Um, final final comments from each of you. Well, I would just say that the job of bringing this war to an end is as urgent as any 
responsibility of the peace movement and of broader progressive movements as well. Uh, we need to demand a move towards a ceasefire. It doesn't mean that the U.S. is going to control how the diplomacy goes, but the U.S. needs to be calling for diplomacy and stop focusing on using this war instead of a way of protecting Ukrainian lives to instead focus on bringing Russia to its knees. That's not the recipe for peace, for justice, for stability, for climate, for anything else. So we have a huge job ahead, but I would just urge that we remember that this is not a black and white, good guys versus bad guys. There's no good guys here. We, the goal is not about which side should win this war. It's about how do we end the war? And it's a huge job. I hinted in my presentation about something that I think is really important is people that we know that have been really woken up by um, by seeing this war on TV. Um, when other wars, as Phyllis has mentioned, have been hidden from us, this is an opportunity for us to extend their empathy uh, to, for instance, refugees. If this is the first time in their lives, they've really been hearing about it, refugees you know, tell them about the Central Americans, tell them about the people who died in the truck in Texas. And I don't think there are any Ukrainians um, in that truck. Um, uh, you know, tell them about the connection between food shortages and war, between fossil fuels and war. Um, try to extend their awareness beyond uh, simply this, um, this uh, war in Ukraine that has uh, attracted so much attention. And um, people hearing, especially young people, about nuclear, the threat of nuclear weapons for the first time. I mean, uh, those of us who grew up in the 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, nuclear war permeated our dreams. Um, uh, you know, this is something that hasn't gone away, but now people are a little bit more aware about. Um, so, um, you know, try to use this opportunity to extend the field of people's empathy and um and uh to look at possible uh possibly getting involved uh if you're getting involved for ukrainian refugees maybe you could get involved for afghan refugees or syrian refugees or central american refugees or palestinian refugees so um i think that's a real task that many of the people uh that perhaps are attending could take on and educate yourself um uh, you know don't just rely on the mainstream media about what's going on in ukraine especially go to uh, Eastern European sources, I uh, like the Barricade, which is based in Bulgaria, really great analysis of what's going on that isn't cheering on either side. Um, books like by Anatoly Yevin, uh, Ukraine and Russia, Fraternal um, Rivalry, Yulia Yurchenko's Ukraine and the Empire of Capital from Marketization to Armed Conflict was very helpful to me to figure out what's going on, not just in the context of Ukraine versus Russia, but Ukraine is becoming part of the capitalist West and what that has meant for the people there and how that has fed the war. Um, so these perspectives that are perhaps more complex, that aren't binary, that aren't either or, that aren't black and white, can help us figure out what else is going on in the world, which is also not always black and white and uh and our own place in it so thank you for this opportunity and i think norm is also going to share a similar presentation i gave i don't know what happened with the uh, uh with the powerpoint it's the same that we tested earlier that worked fine but uh, uh norm is going to share that yes thank you thank you both very much and for everyone that's uh that's listening live now we will be uh posting this uh entire program on both the YouTube channel and the Facebook page of the Progressive Magazine. And we'll also add a link to uh, the full set of slides that, uh, that Zoltan uh, prepared so that you can watch that um, as well. And uh, thanks to both of you so much for joining us tonight. Thanks to all of our sponsors. And uh, thanks to all of you who uh, have been listening and, uh, and will share this information that you've learned tonight with your friends and colleagues. Thank you. Thank you.